Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. Hey, my name is Jerry, and I am one of the pastors here at the Mount, and I feel so honored to be able to share God's Word with you today. And hey, if you're watching from our Fredericksburg or our online campus, then we are so glad that you tuned in as well. You know, it's actually been exciting over these last months to see how God has been at work on our online ministry. So many people are watching from home, and we've seen people make decisions in Christ from uh, from Ohio and New Jersey, New York, all over the place and all over the world. Matter of fact, uh, I just saw that somebody just right now is watching us from Belize. And matter of fact, if that's you, uh, send us your info and I want to send you some gear and a cool Bible today. And if you don't mind, if you're watching us online, if you'll just type in the rest of you uh, where you're watching from. Maybe you're right here in Stafford, maybe you're in California, maybe you're in 29 Palms, maybe you're on a cruise ship uh, in the South Pacific somewhere, and we're glad that you're tuned in. And let me say, if you have a question about your relationship with God, that's what our online hosts are there for. Please feel free to just type and begin to chat with them. They can even take you to a private uh, chat room and share with you more about Christ and help you in any way that they can. Now, this morning, we're going to be continuing our comeback series as we follow the Apostle Paul on his missionary journey. You know, I think everyone enjoys to hear a good comeback story. Many of you have experienced comeback in your own lives. Some of you might have lost a home or a job, and yet somehow God has worked, and now you have maybe even a better job. You've got another place to live, and you've come back. Maybe you've experienced a failed relationship. Maybe you thought you were going to have to live the rest of your life alone, but somehow God has brought someone else in your life, and now, you know, you've come back, and you're happier than ever. Or maybe some of you have lost everything due to drugs or alcohol, and yet God has given you the power to overcome. Maybe you got involved in our our Celebrate Recovery Ministries, and now you've come back, and you're healthy, and you're building that life again. Or maybe somebody would say, man, Jerry, I I wish I could say I've come back. But actually, if I'm honest, I'm in one of the worst places in my life. Maybe because of COVID, you feel isolated and alone. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're just really in a bad place right now. And if that's you today, if you're watching us online, maybe you're in a hotel room somewhere and you are just isolated and alone, then today I would say you, you've come to the right place. And I would also say, don't give up. You know, at my gym, they put these motivational sayings on the wall to kind of try to spur you on. There's a couple by Winston Churchill. You're familiar. They're kind of that World War II era. And one of them I like, he says, you know, never, never, never give up. Yeah, good looking guy there, Winston Churchill. You know, the other one, he says, you know, if you're going through hell, Keep going. That's not the time to check into Motel 6. You know, you don't want to kind of waller around while you're there. That's when you put one foot in front of the other. You put your eyes on Christ. And then you do everything in your power that you can do to get out of that situation. Sometimes people are like, oh, I don't have a job. Oh, things are bad. But they just sit on their couch. No, that's what you do everything you can do. Leave the rest to God and then just see how he is going to begin to work in your life. I was reading a comeback story recently of uh, a young lady. She was a struggling single mom, and she was having to work at night to make ends meet, take care of her child during the day. And uh, she had a dream to write a book. And finally, after a good while, she wrote the book, but the manuscript was rejected 12 times before it was published. And even then they said, eh, don't quit your night job because we don't really know if this is going to go anywhere or not. It's a long shot. But finally, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was published and J.K. Rowling sold over 450 million books. Not a bad comeback. One more story. Before becoming one of the best NBA players, I think, in all of basketball history, Michael Jordan was 5'11 in high school and rejected by his, high, his varsity team because he was too short. But according to Jordan, failure is just a part of eventual success. And Jordan led, of course, the Chicago Bulls to six NBA championships. He won the MVP 
five times, and he even starred in the movie Space Jam, maybe one of the greatest movies of all time. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. You may have to watch and see for yourself. Well, he said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. He said, I have failed over and over and over again in my life. But he said, and that is why I succeed. See, never give up. Don't give up on your dreams. Learn from the situation that you're in. John Maxwell says, when you're on the ground, pick something up while you're down there. You know, learn from that experience so you can take it and do better when, you, when, you know, when you've arrived. So as we look at the book of Acts this morning, we're going to see uh, another comeback story of how Paul went from being in prison in Caesarea to an all-expense-paid cruise to Rome, to where he's going to share the message of Christ. Now, we might look at that and say, eh, I don't know about that one, Jerry. I, I don't know if that sounds like a comeback story to me. I mean, that cruise, he was, you know, he was, he was in jail, he was in prison, he was beaten, he was bit by a snake. You know, he had a, a pretty rough way to go, but uh, he was, but, but if we look at his story, we see that God is using this for, to accomplish his purpose and his mission in Paul's life. But, you know, sometimes we look at success through different optics than what God does, don't we? Well, Acts 23, 11, the Lord said, Be encouraged, Paul, for just as you've been a witness for me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. So God is now about to use this situation that Paul is in uh, before King Agrippa to send him to Rome. And let's begin with our scripture this morning. We're going to begin with Acts 25, verses 23 to 25. And it says, So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived in the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all uh, who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving of death. However, since he's appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. So Agrippa was the authority on Jewish affairs and on Jewish conflicts. His great-grandfather was Herod the Great, who tried to kill uh, Jesus when he was born. His dad had the apostle James beheaded and Peter arrested. So now here he and uh, King Agrippa and his sister Bernice, they come into the auditorium. And it says they came with great pomp. Now, that's not a word. You probably don't use the word pomp every day. Maybe pomp and circumstance, that's whatever that is. It proms is the only thing I can think of. But that word means splendid, magnificence, ostentatious, or a vain display. But you know, the Bible tells us that the pomp of this world is passing away. But the word of God and his kingdom will last forever. Now, let's look at chapter 26, verses 1 to 11. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For I know you're an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now please listen to me patiently. As the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I've been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Now I am on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day. And they share the same hope that I have. Yet, your majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. Why does it seem so incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. And indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. 
Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. And I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. So I think we can learn from uh, the way Paul uh, greets King Agrippa in this passage. The first thing we can learn is that we can leverage every situation we're in for something greater. Now, Paul is a master at leveraging the situation he's in for his purpose. You may remember a few weeks ago, Pastor talked about, Pastor Todd talked about how he was in uh, Athens. And as he walked through the city, how he was really burdened because he saw all these idols, you know, in homage to all these gods. And he sees one to the God with no name. So he's just brilliant thinker, I think, he, as he speaks to the council and to the philosophers. He says, hey, guys, I'm walking through the city, and I see these idols, and I notice there's one with no name. Matter of, so, matter of fact, you've actually been worshiping the God I'm talking about. You didn't even know his name. Brilliant, brilliant. You know, instead of getting, on, you know, getting them on the fence, he's saying, hey, you're already worshiping him. Let me tell you who he is. He says, he is the, the God who created the heavens and the earth. He has no needs and can't be served by human hands. And now, just like with those philosophers, instead of putting Agrippa on the defense, he says, I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you're hearing my case because I know that you're an expert on all Jewish customs. Maybe he's buttering them up a little bit, but instead of putting him on the, the defense, you know, he's, he's just being very tactful of how he approaches this. And then he says, I'm on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of the promise of God. And how can you argue with that? Now, uh, what we can learn from this, I think, is that when we have the opportunity to share our faith with someone, if we'll respect who they are, respect where they're coming from, if we come to them very genuinely and uh, sincerely and with love, then they're going to be much more apt to respond and to listen to what it is we have to say. We don't just beat them over the head with a Bible. That doesn't work. It turns people off. We can learn from how Paul approached and how he shared his message of faith. So now Paul begins to share his testimony. And he begins by sharing how, man, he hated to hear even the name of Jesus. He condemned Christians to death. He had them tortured until they would curse Jesus' name. He despised Christians so much that he would chase them down to other cities. And it was on one of these trips that something amazing happened. This is the best part of the passage, verses 12 through 18. And it says, one day I was on such a mission to Damascus, <clears throat> armed with the authority and the commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Well, well, who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I've appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and my witness. And you are to tell the world what you have seen and what I will show you in the future. I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. And yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness of their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Okay, so Paul is on this mission to hunt down Christians and God calls him out. You know, we've all probably been called out maybe as a kid, maybe by our wife. It ain't fun to get called out, especially if it's God doing the calling because God makes it a little dramatic. You know, there's this light, you know, brighter than the sun coming down. They fall to their knees and uh, his companions uh, hear this voice saying, why are you persecuting me? It's useless to fight against my will. Now, I don't know if I got any Star Trek fans in here. If you're a Trekkie, then, uh, you know, you're going to, if so, you're going to remember when Captain Picard, uh, he's, you know, he's on the Enterprise and they're facing off with the Borg. They're this unbeatable enemy. And the Borg's line is, you know, resistance is futile. You know, that's what God is doing here to Paul. He's like, Paul, resistance is futile. 
And Paul's like, okay, but who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus. Now get to your feet. I've got work for you to do. Now, if you go back to Acts 22, you might remember last week, Pastor Brian talked about how, uh, you know, we hear Paul's testimony three times in Acts. There's that first time in real time last week, uh, or we talked about a few weeks ago and then today. But in Acts 22, uh, he gives a few more details than we hear today. And um, in that, that chapter, he says, God said, get up, Paul, and be baptized. Wash your sins away by calling on the name of the Lord. He says, you're to be my servant and my witness. You're to tell the world what you have seen. And he says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes to, uh, that they might turn from darkness to light so that they can receive forgiveness of their sin. So Paul, uh, or God gives Paul a purpose and a mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next point is that, that we should let the mission guide our purpose. Now, it seems like Paul would probably be the most unlikely person there was, uh, you know, to be the spokesperson for Jesus. I mean, he hated Christians. He hunted them down and had them killed. So listen, if you're watching online this morning or you're on one of our, on one of our campuses uh, and you're like, well, uh, you know, if you're thinking, you know, I, I don't know how God could use me or even love somebody like me. Maybe today you would say, well, Jerry, you know, you, you don't understand. You, you don't really know much about me. You know, i am been a bad person. I've got some bad habits. I've done some bad things. I, I, don't, I don't know if God could really love or use somebody like me. Well, if that's you today, then my response to you would be, are you listening to, uh, to Paul's story? God took a person who was really a murderer and killed Christians and not only forgave him, not only gave him a person, a purpose, but he even used him to write a third of the New Testament. So like Paul, I would ask you, has there been a time in your life where you've repented of your sin and asked Jesus to come into your life? You know, I, I remember like it was yesterday when, when I asked Jesus into my heart. I mean, it was 46 years ago. I was 12. And yes, I know you don't have to remind me, Pastor Andrew and the other pastors, Every day of my life, remind me that I'm the old guy on staff. But I remember, you know, in this, this time when I was 12, I was at one of those old-time revivals. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember, but, you know, the evangelist comes. It would be every night for a week, sometimes two weeks in the South, and, uh, you know, we would come and, and worship the Lord. And I remember on this particular night, uh, during the invitation time, we're singing Just As I Am. If you've been around church, you know that one. It's a great oldie, isn't it? And, and I remember I felt the call of God so strong on my life. I knew everything within me that God was calling me to come forward and to give my life to Christ. Back in those days, they made us get out of our seat, come down the aisle, right in front of everybody to make that decision. Some of you know you, you've been there. But I remember I was terrified to get, to, to get up in front of everybody and walk down that aisle as much as I wanted to come. So I remember as they sang the songs, I'm like, God, if they'll sing one more verse, I'll come. They would sing another verse. God, I'm so afraid, but if they sing one more verse, I'll come. And I remember hearing something. I could hear my heart going, do 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 I looked down, I could feel my chest just, it's like my heart was beating out of my chest. I was just so drawn to come forward to accept Christ. And finally, I'm like, okay, God, I promise. They sing one more verse, and then I was afraid they wouldn't. And I, and, I, and I jumped out of my chair, but I forgot my cousin was next to me, so I knocked him down, and he skidded across the aisle. And I came forward, and I asked Jesus to, to come into my heart. And man, my life has never been the same. Guys, it hasn't been perfect. My wife could give you a grocery list of imperfections and of problems and sin in my life. But, but I am forgiven, and, and I have a draw to, to try to strive to be more like Jesus. You know, when we meet Jesus, he forgives us of our sin, and he gives us a mission and a purpose in life. My favorite verse, I think, for a long time has been a familiar one. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Well, Paul had plans, 
that he had his own agenda. And when God brought him to his knees, he gave him a comeback story with a new mission and with a new purpose. You know, and God has also given, given us a, a, mis- a mission to us as individuals and as a church. And he gives us that mission. It's right in Scripture. We call it the Great Commission. You know it. It's in Matthew 28. He says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And God says, I will be with you every step of the way. And then in Acts 1.8, he says, Here, I want, here's how I want you to do it. I want you to start in Jerusalem. Then I want you to go to Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love being a part of a church that's for one more. This church is about going beyond these walls. And it means sometimes we don't do everything according to our preference, what might be a little bit more comfortable for us, because being about that next person and continuing to share the gospel is paramount for us here at the Mount. And our mission of sharing God's love to others, it begins right here at home. You know, one of the great things about this COVID season, it's easy to focus on all the bad things, what we can't do, what's been taken away. There's been a lot of great things that's happened through this season. And one of those things is that it's given us the opportunity to really focus on people that are hurting in our own community. In the last few months, we've been able to de- deliver meals to hundreds of people in the community. We took out all these chairs and we made a packing facility out of this auditorium and we packed food and we took it time after time after time again to people that, that are hurting. And we're about to do that again, actually. And uh, on Mother's and Father's Day, uh, we took about a thousand flowers and grooming kits to little senior adult men and women to about a dozen uh, assisted living centers here in our, in our community. I got so many calls from activities directors saying how much that meant to folks. I got a call once and a lady's crying. I'm like, ma'am, are, are you all right? What's going on? And she's like, I just can't believe that your church would do that to people that they don't even know that don't go to your church. And I'm like, ma'am, that's what we're here, here for. We're to love everybody. It doesn't matter if they come here. And man, when we get over this COVID, we're going to be doing a lot more work in these uh, senior adult centers in the days ahead. There's a family that we found out, they don't go to our church, but they have a child, a little boy, and he has cancer. And they've been doing chemo on him, and he's about to come home. He loves being outside, but they said he can't be anywhere near the sun. So we're helping them to build a gazebo so the boy can go outside in the shade. And we're helping a family just to share the love of Christ. We've taken truckloads of food and snacks to our homeless shelters. You guys brought backpacks so that we could uh, help children in need at school in our community. You guys gave blood as we hosted the Red Cross and, uh, and helped those in need. And the list goes on and on and on of the things that you guys have been doing. And God has blessed and called this church to be a beacon of hope. Our next point here is that we need to be a church that's a church of hope dealers and difference makers. I was trying to say that one right. I didn't want to say we'd be a church of dealers. Hope dealers, not drug dealers. A hope of, uh, church of hope dealers and difference makers. You know, I'm so grateful that we have a pastor that years ago really took a risk. He probably took heat for it, but he said this is going to be a church that 10% of everything that we receive is going to go right back out those walls to share the message of hope. It's not going to go to buildings. It's not going to go to staff. It's not going to go to stuff we want. It's going to go directly to share the message of Christ. That means we have about a half a million dollars that we send right back out this church to share the message of hope around our world. And I believe that's one of the reasons that God has blessed this church so greatly. Well, God told Paul, he said, I want you to get to your feet and you're going to be my witness. You know, the Mount. There's a lot of people at the Mount that have stood to their feet and uh, have decided to be difference makers. And actually, I want you to meet one of those couples right now. This is Scott and Tamara Johnson. They're one of our amazing volunteers here at the Mount. And uh, appreciate you guys coming up here today. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for a living? 
Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Johnson, and I've been in the Coast Guard now on active duty for approximately 26 years now. Right. Uh, I, I lead two programs for the Coast Guard, the first of which is the Recreational Boating Safety uh, Nationwide Program for the Coast Guard. Uh, lots there, but oversee uh, the manufacturing of, of recreational boats that, that you use. Uh, but also, I'm really honored uh, to lead the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which is our volunteer service of 24,000 volunteers nationwide that do great things uh, for the Coast Guard. Man, that, that's awesome. I want to say Ua or Ura or something, but yeah, what am I supposed to say for the Coast Guard? Yeah, we don't have any vocal bonding. Uh, in, in yeah, okay. Coast Guard, all right, so, all right. Uh, Leave that to the Marines. Too, right. too busy for that. All right, all right. Okay, all right. So uh, this lovely wife is Tamara. Tamara, you've got one of the hardest and greatest jobs I think there is that you raise how many? Five. Five kids. How many you got in college? Three in college. Three. Oh, last one going tomorrow, right? Yeah. Manny? Yeah, awesome, no, awesome. Ben, that's Ben. Oh, Ben tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> ben all right, tomorrow. all right. All right. So uh, uh, you guys have been volunteering here at the Mount. You, you enjoy volunteering. You're on our guest services team. Many of you have seen these guys as you come in. Can you tell us why you chose the guest service team? What is it you enjoy about doing that? Sure, Pastor Jerry. First of all, I just want to say, you know, we serve an awesome God. Amen. And, you know, we don't have to serve, we get to serve. And Amen. when you realize that it's, you know, it's a privilege you get to serve an awesome God, it, you know, it's a game changer. And we do that as a family. Uh, we serve together on uh, part of the guest services. It's called the, the welcome team. So we get to take, um, we, like I say, we get, to, we get to take the new people that come, first-time visitors. We get to bring them in the church, show them around, show them the classroom, show them the sanctuary. You know, just <clears throat> show them around and just make them feel like, like they're welcome here and, and just love on them a little bit. So we enjoy that, and that's something that we could do as a family every week. I'm out there with the kid, little ones holding signs and whatnot. So that's where we're at right now with the, with the mount. Amen. Thank you. You know, and I bet a lot of you didn't know that, that you can actually serve or volunteer, rather, as a family. You know, you see the kids, you know, they're holding the signs out front. We love that. If you want to come and volunteer as a family, we have ways you can do that. And now I know you, you started going to Honduras with us on mission trips, and you love that. God really spoke to your heart, so much so you came home and spoke with Scott, and you guys wanted to do something even beyond what we were doing. Can you tell us a little bit? So you started a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the name of that and maybe what, a little bit about what you do through that? Sure. <clears throat> the name of our nonprofit is Mission Ojojona. Ojojona is a town in the southern part of Honduras. It consists of the main village um, of Ojojona, and it's surrounded by remote villages in the mountains surrounding the main village there. So that's the area that we serve right now. Our mission is just um, simple, just to bring faith, hope, and love to these people. Um, we do that through three ministries right now. Uh, we have a soccer ministry, which is discipling the youth through their favorite sport of soccer or football. Uh, our second ministry is up in the village schools, uh, the remote schools. We trek up there. We feed the children lunch, uh, read Bible stories, you know, bring them the word. And also we uh, provide school supplies, um, whatever they need um, to help with their learning. We support the teachers and educational material just to help the kids learn. Um, they don't have much up there. Our third ministry is relatively new, but super exciting. It's our sustainable agricultural ministry. We recently partnered with uh, Pastor Richard down in Honduras, and he teaches sustainable agriculture in these villages, teaching them how to plant crops, how to raise animals for food, that these villages you know, can someday be sustainable. Um, uh, with all these ministries, I think our most important thing we do, though, is we bring the word of God to the people. We just, you know, love on them. We let them know, you know, you're not forgotten. You, know, you may be remote, and, you know, but you're not forgotten wherever you are. You know, God loves you, and he has a plan for you, and it, and it is good. You know, and so we just let them know that. Um, that's, that's the most, our, our most important thing. Right now with COVID, uh, our, our three ministries have been on Hold a little bit, but we're still staying true to our mission of bringing faith, hope, and love. But right now, it's in the form of food bags. So we're packaging up food, beans and rice, um, making these food bags and bringing them, trekking them up to these remote villages, you know, just um, in this time of need for the people. 
Amen. I mean, thank you so much. You guys are really making a difference out there. I don't know. I had the privilege of going with them on their, their first trip to really kick that off. We were out in the, even for Honduras, we were in the middle of nowhere, really out there in the, in the you know, in the extent. Uh, and I know we were going to schools, a little one-room schools, no electricity, you know, no re- resources really. And of course, like you said, right now, there's really... Uh, People are starving there. They're not, they're not able to get food, and you guys are, are trying to do that. So we want you to know that we are proud of you. As your missions pastor, I would say I, I couldn't be more pleased at what you're doing. You've taken what the Mount has done to another level, and you continue to volunteer and do something even greater than what we, we were thinking. So if you don't mind, if you could do us a favor, and as a church, we'd like to give you a check for $5,000. And, uh, and uh, would you take that and go feed kids from the Mount? Just take it and go feed them, all right? Thank you so much, Pastor Jerry. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Pastor Jerry, I just want to also uh, thank you. This is, this is very meaningful. But I want to let the people here know that, that this was a, a calling of Tamara when, when she went to Honduras. Uh, and this is something we had no clue how to do. Uh, we were starting from scratch, have no skills in building a nonprofit or, or doing anything like that. Heck, we don't even know how to speak Spanish. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there has been times, it's been amazing that God has put people in our life for this mission. And there's some people sitting out here today that have been very meaningful and influential in in the mission, and that's Joe and Mary Lou Torres, who some of you may know, and also Norma Wright, who have really stepped up to help us uh, with this mission. I didn't want to let this opportunity go by without acknowledging uh, them, so thank you. Thank you for that. And I know when, as soon as we can get back into Honduras, uh, the uh, Tauruses, they're going to go basically adopt three children that you guys have met down there. They're going to bring them back. And as a church, we're going to help raise these kids as soon as we can get them up here. So we're excited about that. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you for coming. All right. All right. Well, you know, we talked about how God has allowed us to take this season and minister to uh, to our own community. Next year, we're putting all of our trips back on the slate. We're going back to Honduras. We're going to Haiti. We're going to Africa. We're going to Cambodia. We're going to continue to share that message of hope around the world. And if I could, before I, before I kind of begin to close out, I'd like to share you with just a, uh, an experience that was real meaningful to me. A few years ago, we went to uh, Cambodia. We have another family in our church. We have so many families that are so generous and so loving in our church. And uh, one of these families is the, the Georges, and they've, they really had an affinity for Cambodia. And uh, so they have actually uh, helped to build seven orphanages around that country. Well, actually, to this date, 14. But when we went a few years ago, they had built seven. And so when we went to Cambodia, we had a team, mostly of college students, mostly college girls on this one. And each day we would go to a different orphanage and we'd basically do what we would think of as vacation Bible school. We would do, you know, a song and a craft. We'd have fun with the kids and play with them, have a snack. And we would share the message of of Christ. I had the privilege of doing that and we had kind of chosen that we were going to use the creation story. And uh, so as we were headed to the first school, we had stopped at this little roadside place and this little girl came out and she would want to know if I'd give her a dollar to get a picture with with this spider that she had. Yeah, and there there she is right there. And so, and I was like, uh, I said, hey, that's pretty cool. How much if I just buy her? And she said, $2. And I said, okay, uh, I'll just buy her. And so we named her Tammy the Tarantula. And so Tammy actually stayed with us the entire rest of the trip. Almost the entire trip, she stayed right there on my Vanderbilt hat. And uh, so every day we went to, the, uh, to another school. I would put Tammy on my, uh, on my hat, and I would, I would teach the creation story. Sometimes I would have 100 children out there. And the whole time that I'm speaking, those kids were like, oh. And they would not take their eyes off my hat. Amani, it's something we should do here probably. No, you don't think so. And so, so uh, you know, and then when I would get to the part of the creation of what God, you know, he made animals and creatures. And I would say, like Tammy. And they would be like, oh, that's not real because she never moved. And like, oh, really? I would put her on my arm and she would scurry up sometimes at my face, back, back on my hat. And they'd be, ah! screaming at everything. But here's the point. Why would you tell me that story? If God can use a tarantula 
to help me to share the message of Christ. I promise he can use every single one of you. And then when we got uh, about halfway through that trip, we ended up in Phnom Penh. Have you ever been to Cambodia? It's where Angkor Wat is. If you never heard of that, Google it. It's one of the seven man-made wonders of the world. It's phenomenal. And uh, so each day we would from there go out to an orphanage and come back. And when we came back, we began to notice these children in an alley in front of where we were staying. And they were very tattered, clothes all worn, dirty. And uh, so we said, you know, hey, let's minister to these kids. It's not the one we came for, but hey, we're seeing this need. So each day we came back, we would bring either ice cream or candy or something to give the kids. And of course, as the week went on, they were waiting for us every day and we would throw ball and, uh, and we would play with them and just love on them. And after a couple of days, this lady, uh, she kind of very shyly made her way to us one day. And, and uh, of course, we had to use interpreters while we were speaking. And she said, uh, can, I, can I talk to you? She said, I just wanted to say thank you. No one has ever loved our children like this. Thank you. And, uh, and so we began to talk to her. And we found out that she was actually a prostitute that was working in a brothel there on, in the alley. And, and I called one of our college girls, Jennifer, and I said, hey, I want you to experience this. And, and so I said, ask her what we can do for her. And so she did, and, and the lady reached over and she grabbed the straps of Jennifer's sundress. She said, can, can I have one of these? And Jennifer looked over at me, and I've never seen anybody's eyes instantly that I could see just whoo, fill up with water, but like these big pools of water. And, of course, I'm like, yes, 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 tell her yes. And I said, ask her uh, how many more ladies are there? We found out there were six or eight more prostitutes at the brothel. And I said, uh, ask them if they'll all come tomorrow night and we'll have them all addressed. So they left. And I gave the girls money. I said, tomorrow, uh, I want you to go to the market, buy them all a dress, get a basket and, uh, uh, you know, just make them a care pack. Whatever you think would bless them, snacks, lotion, whatever it is, and do that. And uh, so sure enough, the next day came and and right as it was getting dark, all the ladies, the prostitutes came out of the, bro the brothel and they came up very shyly, kind of maybe not knowing what was going on. And our girls handed them each a basket. And of course, the ladies are crying. <laughs> of course, we're all crying by now. And one of the ladies said, I don't understand. Why would you do that? No one's ever loved us or did anything for us like that. Why would you do that? And guys, just like the lady who called me a couple of weeks ago from one of our own assisted living centers, I was able to say it's because God loves you. You are the very person that Christ came and he died for. He, he, he cleansed you of your sin and he wants to give you a purpose and a mission and hope in life. And then those ladies did something I wasn't expecting. They circled us and were holding hands and said, can we pray for you? So here we are, a mission team from the Mount, 6,000 miles away from home, standing in an alley with prostitutes praying for us. Man, that, that experience changed my life. It reminded me, just another reminder, guys, we exist to share the message of hope to prostitutes, to, to orphans, to the elderly, to those hurting, to the homeless, to those in need. That's what God has called us to do, to be a church that's for one more, not just to have a holy huddle. Yeah, we come here and worship. We come here and learn about Christ, but we do it so we can go out and minister to those in need. So I ask you this morning, what is God calling you to do? Just to finish a few verses, Paul is finishing his testimony here. And Agrippa interrupts and he says, he says in verse 28, he said, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? And Paul replies, hey, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that you and everyone in this audience would be just as I am, except for these chains. And the last point here that we can learn from that is to use our platform to lead others to Jesus. You know, God has gifted every single one of you with a platform that you can leverage as a way to share your faith with someone else. And I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm just talking about share with those around you how God loves you and how he 
loves them. The people you work with, the people you live next to, uh, your friends and your family. You know, just a few days ago, I was speaking with one of our guys, Frank Malave. Some of you might know him. Actually, another Coast Guard guy uh, in our church here. And he was, he was saying, uh, he said, man, you know, I just got back from the slug lot. He said, I'm coming home from work from Belvoir, and uh, I'm riding with a guy who's an atheist. And he said, we get to the slug lot, and we talk for an hour about Christ. And I'm like, way to go, Frank. Way to go, Frank. So this morning, I want to say, you know, maybe some of you need to say, you know what? I've not been living to my potential. I've not been using my gifts or sharing my faith with those around me. Maybe today you say, you know, I already know Jesus is my Savior. There's no question there, but I need to kind of begin a comeback story by renewing my commitment to God, by saying, God, whatever it is, you want of my life, I'm willing, and that's what I want to do. Or maybe today you would say, you know, I'll, I need to begin a comeback story for the first time. I want to confess my sin and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. You know, God said to Paul, we talked about a while ago, he said, get up and be baptized. Wash your sins away by calling on the name of the Lord. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment, if you don't mind. If you're Fredericksburg, watching us online. Hey, good to see you guys again as well. Today, maybe there's someone out there that would say, you know what, maybe I'm like Paul. I wasn't a very good person. Maybe I'm still not. But I hear what you're saying, and I want this Jesus you're talking about. I need redemption of my sin, and I want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. God says the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. We can't get to heaven because we're a good person. We can't get to heaven because our name is on a church roll, because we've been dunked in a pool, because our granddaddy was a a preacher. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Maybe out there somewhere today is someone that would say, uh, today I'm ready to to make Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Maybe you're sitting right now in a hotel room and you are so lonely, you feel so isolated. There might be someone out there that's, you've been thinking about taking your own life because you just have no hope. If that's you today, then I wanna say there is hope. There is a God that loves you and he wants to give you meaning and purpose in life. And he just asks, would you receive, would you receive me? So today I wanna, I wanna, pray a prayer here in a moment for those that will say, all right, I'm ready to ask Jesus in my heart. And if that's you today, uh, you know, the the prayer goes something like this. It kind of goes something like, God, I love you. I believe that you're alive and you're listening to my prayer. Uh, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. From this moment on, I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. If that's you today, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to to raise your hand, all right? And then we're gonna do one of two things. We're gonna give you a card. If you'll fill that out, you can even drop it off at our guest service desk and a pastor will call you or you can bring it right to my left after the service. And they wanna give you a beautiful Bible. There'll be some people that will pray with you and can talk with you with any questions you might have. All right, are you ready? I'm gonna say count of one. I'm gonna be like Pastor Todd here. It says, we can't help you if we don't know who you are. Two. Because don't be like I was when I was terrified to get up out of the chair. So I, it took me a while to make that decision because I was afraid of what others would think. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Are you ready to ask Jesus in your heart? Three, raise your hand if you're ready to ask Christ in your heart. Right now, are you ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Whether you're on Fredericksburg, raise your hand. If you're online, then chat with the host, let them know that today you're asking Jesus in there in your heart and they'll get information from you and they'll help you with any questions you may have. Someone in the middle, guys? Anyone else here at staff? Father, I thank you for these this morning that have raised their hands here in Fredericksburg and, and online to say, God, today is the day I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. God, may you come into their life, forgive them of their sin, Cleanse them of their unrighteousness and give them a purpose and a hope and a meaning in life. Help us as a church to disciple them, to help them to grow in their faith, to be the people that you call them to be. And God, for the rest of us, 
Those that already know you, Lord, help us to be the church you call us to be. May we be difference makers. May we be hope dealers. May we we share your love to this community wherever we may go. Thank you, God, for giving us your word. Thank you that you didn't just save us so that we don't go to hell. You saved us so we could have peace, hope. We would never be alone because you were always by our side. Thank you, God, for this day, great day of worship. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, in Jesus' name.